thank you guys for inviting me to speak here. Um, okay, so let's, the first thing I, I wanna um, tell you about is a family of symmetric functions called Catalan functions. Uh, so by the way, I, if, if people interrupt me, that's fine. It, it's a little harder to get feedback in this setting from the audience. So I can see a couple of you, but not too many. Um, uh, but you know, feel free to, to um, ask questions uh, a good portion of this talk is supposed to be sort of an introduction to um, uh, finite type A crystals. Um, so, so it's not just about um, my work. I want you guys to, you know, it's a little bit more like uh, some general background. Um, so please interrupt me with questions. Um, all right. Okay. So, so Catalan functions are um, a family of symmetric functions uh, studied by Panishev and Chen Heyman. Uh, starting around 10 or so years ago. Uh, in, in a couple slides, I'll give you a precise sort of algebraic uh, and combinatorial definition. Um, but uh, let me just say a few general things right now. So they have a, um, a geometric description in terms of Euler characteristics of certain vector bundles on the flag variety. Um, and they've been studied quite extensively, at least in certain special cases in terms of this geometric perspective. Uh, they contain many uh, interesting, well-studied classes of symmetric functions as special cases. So most notably are the uh, modified Hall-Littlewood polynomials, we call H mu. These are positive sums of sure functions uh, with the coefficients being uh, the, what I've called K lambda mu of Q, the koska folks polynomials. Um, so this, this is gonna come up a few times in this talk. So I thought it would be good to just show you guys a picture. So, there's a uh, celebrated result of us, Gu and Schutz and Berger, which um, describes these uh, modified Hall Littlewood polynomials uh, as a sum of sure functions um, given by, so a sum over what are called semi standard Young tableau uh, of a specific content. So here, for example, uh, H22 is given by the uh, semi standard Young tableau of content 2, 2. That means there's two ones and two twos. Uh, and then you pick up a certain statistic, which is called charge, which I'll talk about more later, but I'm not gonna have time to fully explain. Um, but anyway, that statistic gives you some uh, Q power on each of these tableau. And then you take the shapes of the tableau and that turns into this sure positive sum, uh, uh, the symmetric function, which is sure positive. Okay, so here's the various uh, modified hall littlewood polynomials for partitions of length four. Okay, just to give you some flavor for what these are, because uh, the Catalan functions are sort of a natural generalization of this class. Okay, so other things that, that uh, the Catalan functions include are certain um, parabolic generalizations of these modified Hall Littlewood polynomials. Another thing are what are known as the K sure functions. These are functions which arose in the study of uh, the McDonald positivity conjecture. Uh, and were later connected to the homology of the affine Grassmannian. Um, so one of the um, new things I want to tell you about today is a connection to what are called generalized Demajure crystals. Uh, the, the sort of general crystal theory here that we need is pretty uh, difficult. So I'm going to kind of give um, a little bit of a shadow of it in, in um, what, it, what are known as sort of the finite type A crystals. Okay, but we'll, we'll at least get some hints of this connection. Okay. Um, okay, so let me start by um, uh, giving you, um, oh, sorry, one more thing I wanted to mention about this. Uh, so one of, our, um, one of our results from several years ago was a proof that the k sure functions are sure positive. Uh, and that use this connection, realizing them as a subclass of Catalan functions. Uh, so somehow having this uh, wider class of functions allows sort of more inductive techniques that weren't available for just the K-Sure functions alone. So that's one reason to go to a wider class like this. And in fact, in this, in this work, we actually generalize them further to certain non-symmetric variants. And that's how we get this, we found this connection to the uh, generalized Demajure crystal. So somehow allowing this greater generality can sometimes make things easier by allowing sort of better inductive arguments. Okay, so 
Now let's get into some details. So we're gonna, so these Catalan functions um, lie in, let's say the, the ring of um, Laurent polynomials in L variables, or sometimes we'll have to go to this uh, power series ring. Um, okay, and we have the symmetric group acting by permuting the variables. Uh, SI is gonna denote the simple transposition. Uh, and we have this formula for what's known as the de majeure operator pi i. So you, you act by this SI, which exchanges XI and XI plus one, multiplied by XI plus one and so on. So this is the formula, but to get an idea of what it does, it's just enough to sort of see what it does to monomials. And basically it only acts in sort of two consecutive uh, variables at a time. And this example is really indicative of what happens in general. Uh, so for example, if I have a monomial with exponent vector five, two, that's going to go to, well, I'm going to keep that exponent vector five, two, and then I'm going to get the flip of it and then sort of everything in between. Okay. Uh, and, and so that this is sort of the general pattern. All right. So it turns out that these de majeure operators satisfy uh, the braid relation. So pi one, pi two, pi one, is equal to pi two pi one pi two. And therefore that it means that it makes sense to talk about for any element of the symmetric group, you can talk about a corresponding pi sub w, which is the product of pi i's corresponding to simple reflections that made up uh, your word. So you write your word as a product of simple reflections uh, and then you write the corresponding product of pi i's and that's what pi sub w is. Okay, so uh, for now, we'll, we'll talk about these more later, but for now, um, we're interested in what pi w naught does. So w naught is the longest permutation in the symmetric group. Uh, and pi w naught is, you want to think of it as a, is what we call a sure function straightening. So, um, so I'm going to let s mu denote the sure function uh, indexed by the partition mu, or more generally by any weakly decreasing sequence. Okay, and um, pi w naught of, uh, let's say, a, a part x to the sum partition, that's just going to give you back the sure function since pi w naught is a symmetrizing operator, okay? Um, but if you feed it something x to the gamma for a general gamma uh, in z to the l, then you get a sure function or zero up to a sign. So let's just see how that comes out. So if I, if I give you gamma equals three, one, two, five, the way to figure out what happens is you first you add a row this vector of three, two, one, zero in this case. Uh, and if it has a repeated part, then you get zero. Otherwise, um, as in this example, so you take gamma is four, seven, one, six, if you add row, uh, then you sort, and you don't get a repeated part, then you sort the result, nine, seven, six, two, and then subtract row, and that's the resulting sure function you get, uh, together with the sign, which measures how many times you have to uh, flip to get from this gamma plus rho to the sorted inversion. Okay, so one of the inputs to data data to a Catalan function is what we call a root ideal. So we're going to let delta plus be this um, index set for the set of positive roots, which we'll just identify with these um, squares that are above the diagonal here. And the root ideal is just an upper right justified subset of these squares, as in this red example in red. Okay, and so now we can define the Catalan function is uh, the polynomial, the following polynomial. So it's indexed by uh, a set of positive roots and some uh, gamma in z to the l. And what you do is you take this series. Uh, so you want to think of these one minus qxi over xj is ex being expanded as series, where you take one plus qxi over xj plus q squared xi squared over xj squared and so on. Uh, and then, okay, you get a bunch of monomials, you apply this sure function straightening operator. And then the last thing you have to do is you have to take the polynomial truncation. So what that does is it just takes the um, s mu that are indexed by non-partitions and, and sets them to zero. Uh, so the thing without the polynomial truncation is a perfectly good object to study. It's sort of a series version of this. And maybe in some ways it's a better object to study, but uh, for now we want just this polynomial version of it. Okay. So some important special cases are when, when uh, the weight is a partition 
and you have the empty root ideal, well, then this product here is empty and you just get back pi w naught on a x to the partition is just the sure function. Okay. Um, on the other, at the other extreme, if you take all of the positive roots uh, and you take a partition, then you get back this modified Hall-Littlewood polynomial I, I briefly described to you at the beginning. Okay, so, so in general, the more sort of roots you have, the bigger this expression is, is a sum of sure functions. And yeah, so you can get kind of all kinds of thing, things in between these two extremes. Um, maybe another, another way, um, just, to, just to understand this a little better, another way to understand what these are is, this is um, some, some like qified version of what you get when you multiply, when you take the homogeneous symmetric function h2 times h1 times h1. So it's, it's when you set Q to one, then you just get a product of uh, these homogeneous symmetric functions. Okay, anyway, so here's an example of where it's, uh, that's different. So let's take this, just these three roots in the upper right, and now I'll just rewrite what it is in terms of the definition. Okay, and so now, now we have to expand out each of these as series, okay? So for example, like this x to the, this is, these are exponent vectors here. So this means x1 cubed, x2 to the fourth, x3 squared, and so on. Um, so this x3420 came from the x3321 by adding one to this, this three, this second three, and then subtracting one from this one here. So that corresponded to like one of the terms from this, from expanding this as a series actually the degree one term, okay? Uh, and so this is, this is gonna give some infinite thing, but because of the polynomial truncation, there's sort of an easy way to see that a lot of these terms are gonna disappear. And the ones that I've left here are the ones that are sort of not obviously zero, okay? And, but there's additional cancellation that happens here. So now we have to do this, we have to apply this pi w naught. So that straightens all these. So for example, this five, three, zero, one, uh, when I add row to this, I'm going to get a repeated part, and this is going to disappear. Uh, whereas, for example, this 6, 3, this is 6, 3, minus 1, 1. When this straightens, it's going to become 6, 3, 0, 0 with a sign, and it will cancel with this guy. Okay, so when you simplify it, you just get this sure positive expression again. All right, so now this is interesting to see, right? We, we got sure positivity out of this. But it's, it's sort of not clear from this expression that it would be sure positive since there's lots of cancellation involved in this uh, straightening operation. Okay. okay, so I mentioned this result of Lescu and Schutz and Berger, which expresses the modified Hollywood polynomials in terms of semi standard Young tableau, uh, weighted by this certain non negative integer statistic on those tableau called charge. Okay, so uh, later on, uh, starting around the 90s, so I guess this Lescu, Schutz, and Berger was the 70s. Um, in the late 90s, people started studying uh, a generalization of this um, to uh, what we call parabolic root ideals. So this is, for example, you take the set of roots above a block diagonal matrix. So here the block sizes are one, three, and then two. Okay, and and for these uh, these corresponding Catalina functions, um, these Corresponding coefficients are sometimes called generalized Koska coefficients, uh, and they've been studied from several different perspectives. So just to give you a brief, a uh, very brief survey of what's been done about these. So Brower was maybe one of the first to study these. He looked at them from the geometric perspective uh, and showed that, um, uh, well, so from that perspective, I mentioned, remember they're uh, graded Euler characteristics of certain vector bundles. Um, so that means that there are some alternating uh, some of uh, the the characters of um, cohomology. Okay, so but if if you know that the higher cohomology vanishes, then automatically it tells you that this this thing is sure positive. So that's a connection between sure positivity and this geometric picture, and that's kind of one direction to if if you want to think about it a certain way. This this is a direction to strengthen the sure positivity. Uh, results about these and conjectures. So another way to sort of strengthen sure positivity is to try to ask for an explicit 
positive combinatorial formula for the coefficients in the Schur expansion. And the same case, uh, the Brouwer study, these parabolic root ideals, uh, Shimazona Wayman conjectured an explicit formula for these in terms of something called catabolism that I'll tell you about soon. Okay, so this is kind of a map of other uh, results that are known uh, about um, sure positivity. So I mentioned a few of them, um, maybe a couple of things to highlight here. So the case when the um, root ideal is parabolic and then gamma is a partition which is constant on the parabolic block speeding. So like, I, I like to draw the partition as in this example, I like to draw the partition along the diagonal of these um, diagrams. So if we, that would mean that, you know, we'd have, it would be sort of constant on these three entries here and, and on these two. Okay, so in that special case, uh, this problem has been well studied and there are several different combinatorial formulas known. Uh, Brower also did prove that cohomology vanishing conjecture in this case. Um, uh, Lee Chung Chen and Mark Heyman, so Mark Heyman is my, is my PhD advisor, his student Lee Chung Chen, uh, they together conjectured uh, a way to extend the Shimazona Wayman conjecture to cover any uh, root ideal psi. Uh, still, gamma has to be a partition. Um, Brower worked out uh, when psi is a uh, full root ideal, worked out sort of the exact general conditions for cohomology vanishing to occur. Um, maybe the most interesting thing here is that this, this shows that sort of this condition, gamma being a partition, is close to best possible. So if you want sure positivity to hold, then you need something like gamma, like gamma's partition is, is almost the best you can hope for. Okay. Um, uh, one additional result. So Panyushev studied this problem from the geometric perspective uh, and gave a quite general class. Uh, so this condition, um, which is a little hard to decipher, if this holds, then, then he showed that the cohomology vanishing holds and therefore, therefore sure positivity holds. Um, so this one special case of this is when the weight is strictly decreasing. Okay, so, so that's a subset of the partition case and the, and the root ideal is anything. Uh, but it still doesn't cover the Chen Heyman or the Shimazona Wayman um, cases. So these, these two conjectures on cohomology vanishing are open. Uh, these two conjectures here, um, we basically solve, and that's what I'm going to tell you about. The, the um, Chen Heyman conjecture, we don't uh, actually solve it, but we give another very similar looking sure positive formula for this case. Okay. Okay, so I want to tell you now about what this formula is, um, and then I'm going to tell you about sort of some crystal theory that, that is related to it. Okay, so. Um, we're going to start by talking about uh, what are called tabloids. So basically, um, well, maybe uh, I, I guess I sort of assumed you knew what uh, tableau are, but let's just say so. Uh, a tableau um, is when you have your all your cells sort of upper left justified, and the columns are strictly increasing, and the rows are weakly increasing. But here for a tabloid, we don't require anything about the columns. We just require the rows be weakly increasing. Um, okay. So now we're going to define an operation called partial insertion. So what this does is you start with a, a tabloid and we're going to let PIL uh, denote the result of column inserting the last uh, row into rows I through L. Okay, and, and by the way, we, we always want to sort of fix an L and we'll work in tabloids of a fixed uh, row length L. Even though some of those rows might be empty, we still consider it to be length L. Because so here L is five. We're gonna take the last row and we'll insert it. We're gonna column insert it into these uh, rows two, three, and four and ignore the first row. So here's what happens when we do that. So the five comes in and then the four bumps the five. And then, so this is the Shen set algorithm, but it's, it's going column by column. Maybe the more usual one to see is row by row. Here the three, let's see, the three comes in and bumps the three, which bumps the three. So we get that. The two um, bumps the two, bumps the three, bumps the three. And now this last two is gonna come in and bump this two. And then it's gonna bump the two, bump the three, bump the three. And we end up with this. Okay, so this is a sort of brief um, display of the column insertion algorithm here. 
unlike normal, normally you would talk about column insertion where you inserted a single column into a tableau. But here we're only restricting uh, the insertion to work on certain rows. Uh, and by the way, we need for this to make sense, we need those rows to already be a tableau. Otherwise, I guess, I don't know what column insertion means, but uh, it will be in sort of the cases that we need it to be. Um, okay. okay, so we need another operation called cat. And what cat does is it removes the smallest letter from, from the tableau, uh, and then it um, takes uh, the top row and moves it down to the bottom. Okay. So basically just rotates the rows and gets rid of the smallest letter. All right, and now we define uh, a tableau to be catabolizable with respect to a sequence uh, of non-negative integers if basically we apply a sequence of cats and partial insertions and we want always the smallest letter to always lie on the top row. Okay, so here's a sort of big example. So this is the cat that we just did. And now let's do this partial insertion. So we insert up to row two. Notice that we started with a, um, with a tableau. So we started with column strictness. But now when I do this operation, um, I get this seven got moved over here. And normally the seven, if we had done normal column insertion, the seven would have bumped the seven here so that we would have seven, seven on this row here and, and it would have maintained the column strictness. But since we're only doing a partial insertion, we can get things like this. Okay. So, um, okay, so let's see what happens. So we keep doing this alternating and, and the which partial insertions we do are dictated by this sequence of uh, integers. Okay, and, and just to get some flavor for what this looks like. Okay, so we, we got all the way to the end and at every step um, when we applied cat, uh, always the smallest letters were always on the top row. Okay, so this this is catabolizable. Uh, okay, so here's an example um, where it's not catabolizable. So let's just go through these steps. So we get to the end here, um, and we're about to apply this cat operator, but the sixes don't all lie on the on the top row. So we say this is not catabolizable. Any, any questions? Okay. Okay, so let me state the theorem for you now. So we're gonna need this statistic a few times. So given a root ideal, I'm just gonna define N of psi sub I to be sort of the number of, um, of these blue squares in each row. So it's the number, the diagonal plus going up to the root ideal uh, and stopping. So, so two, three, two, one in this example. Okay, I don't care about the last row here. Okay, so the theorem is that it looks a lot like the Lascaux, Schutz, and Berger result I told you about, but the only difference is that we filter our set of semi-standard Young tableau of content mu by those ones that are catabolizable with respect to this sequence. So the sequence and psi, this is where the sort of the data of the root ideal comes in. It tells me what sort of kind of catabolizability filter I'm taking. Uh, just as sort of a sanity check, um, if psi is the full root ideal, what happens? Well, uh, then, then the sequence is one, 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 one. And so what that means is that these partial insertions will always be actual full insertions into the entire tableau. Okay, and that means that all, all these intermediate steps will get genuine tableau and therefore their smallest letter will always lie entirely on the bottom row. Okay, so that means that um, in this filtering operation, we actually don't filter at all. Everything is catabolizable and we recover less scooch shoots and Berger. Okay, um, now when psi is parabolic, it turns out that this matches the conjecture of Shimazoma Wayman. So we recover this uh, as a special case of our result. So question, uh, mm -hmm. can it happen that you, in, in the middle of your steps, you don't get a tableau, but then you try to insert like, what is it going to be non catabolizable or what's what's or partial insertion and and the things that are supposed to be a tableau or not yeah, yeah that, so that can't happen but that's not obvious so you have to check that yeah. oh, okay thanks mm. 
There's also, I'm also giving you sort of the fast definition of partial insertion. There's another version of partial insertion where it doesn't matter whether it's a tableau or not. So that's kind of another way to address that. Okay. I have a question first. So the, I know Jennifer Morse and the others, and also Leskovich Schutzberger have worked with this uh, companion map on fillings, basically. Uh, are you familiar with this? Where you sort of exchange the shape and content of a tableau? Uh, so I, I think I know probably what is happening there, but I, I don't, I haven't like directly read those papers. At the end of the talk, I'm going to tell you about a map, which is probably somehow equivalent to that. Oh, okay, cool, thanks. Yeah, so yeah. Well, we, you can maybe bring up that question again, and I might be able to answer. Like, if you can see how it's connected to in, then we can maybe see talk. Okay, so so now um, I want to tell you. So I want to start now with a sort of introduction to uh, crystals, uh, and then we'll see a, bit, a little bit about how they're connected to um, Catalina functions. Okay, so uh, I'm just going to work with um, GLL crystals, so finite type A crystals. Uh, these are maybe the best place to start if you're learning crystal theory. And by the way, I um, I think some of the best references from learning crystals from the combinatorial perspective are um, uh, Hong Kang chapter seven and uh, Shimazono Wayman, or sorry, just uh, Shimazono's uh, crystal for gummies little paper or notes. Um, if you want to learn more about this subject, okay. So um, so what is a crystal? So the data, the sort of data telling you specifying a crystal is a set B together with a weight function taking values in Z to the L uh, and crystal operators um, EI and FI, uh, which are usually drawn as sort of a color directed graph as shown. Okay, so the E's always go the opposite direction of the F's. So they're sort of carrying the same data. This zero is just a dummy element uh, to tell you um, that there's no edge leaving a given, there's no edge leaving a given vertex, okay? And so these, these graphs are always gonna have at most one outgoing edge. Um, if there's no outgoing edge, then you say that that element maps to this dummy element zero, okay? So now there is a way to talk about crystals where, um, so it's, I could say it's this data together satisfying some axioms about sort of how EI and EI plus one interact um, but, and, and that's a good way to, to describe crystals in, in some settings, but for this case of finite type A crystals, it's maybe simpler just to say, here are all the crystals and explicitly describe them because they're not that hard to ex describe explicitly. So, so these are what they are. So um, given a partition lambda, there's a crystal on the set of semi-standard tableau of shape lambda. Uh, in letters one up to L. And this is an example of, of such thing. So here, my shape is two, one. These are all the semi-standard Young tableau of shape two, one in the letters one up to three. And I need to tell you how to, how to get these edges, um, but we'll, we'll get to that in a bit. Okay, so I'm not gonna tell you that right yet. Um, but maybe important to mention, uh, for the perspective, at least of this talk, um, it is handy to have another indexing object for the vertices. Uh, and so one, often we like to index the vertices by uh, words. So one way to go between uh, tableau and words is you can take what's called the row reading word of the tableau. So you just read the rows from bottom to top. So this would be two, one, one. And that would be sort of another equivalent combinatorial description of the vertices here. Uh, and more generally, we're gonna see that if you look at the set of words with a fixed recording tableau, those also form sort of good labels for this, this set of vertices. Okay. So we'll, we'll be using those. Uh, we'll see more explicitly in a second. Um, and just, I, I sort of mentioned this, but all crystals, GLL crystals, are disjoint unions of these B lambda. So this is kind of mo maybe the most explicit way to sort of describe what crystals are in this case. So crystals are in general defined for any symmetrizable Katz Moody algebra, but these are the only ones that we'll talk about here. Okay, so the sort of most basic kind of crystal and, and the one that we're gonna really, really almost the only one that we're really gonna need is the crystal for a single row shape. Mm. So 
as a set, this is the set of weekly increasing words of length S in the alphabet one to L as shown in this example for S equals two. Um, and the EI operators are given as follows. So you change the um, leftmost I plus one to an I. Okay, so that's, that's the rule as we can see in this example. Um, and so that, that preserves the, a word being weakly increasing, right? It's kind of the only thing you can do um, or well, that, that does the thing that you um, want it to to the weight, but I haven't told you about the weight yet. So maybe that's not useful. Anyway, FI changes um, the rightmost I to an I plus one. So those, those just go the opposite direction of the E's. Uh, and then the weight is in this case, just the content of the word. So it's like the vector consisting of number of ones, number of twos, number of threes and so on. So for example, here there's one, one, zero twos and one three. Okay, so now we need the, so important operation for crystals is the tensor product of two crystals. So as a set, this is just given by the Cartesian product of the two sets. But since we're mostly indexing our crystals by, by words, we're just gonna concatenate those words. Okay, that will give us the set of elements. So for example, this is B1 tensor B2. And if you look at which words occur here, well, there are all the words where the second, the second and third letters are weakly increasing. And that's the only constraint. Otherwise, these are arbitrary words of length three and letters one, to, one up to three. Okay. Um, and so what I need to tell you about is how to get these arrows. Okay, so that's, that's what we'll do next. All right, so to compute these arrows, we use what's called the parentheses matching rule. Okay, so, um, this is an example in B4 tensor B5 tensor B5. Uh, so each of these sort of chunks or blocks has to be weakly increasing. That, that's what it means to be a part of an element of this tensor product. And to compute, uh, let's say E2 or F2, uh, what we do is we, we only look at the twos and the threes. Okay, so the other letters we don't care about. And then we, associate a left parentheses with the threes or right parentheses with the twos, and then we match parentheses in the usual way. And the one, the pairs that get matched up, we just ignore them. And then the remaining guys um, always look like some, some twos followed by some threes, as we see here. And then to apply F, I just do the same thing that we did before on the single row crystal. So it's sort of the only thing that preserves it being weakly increasing, just like we've frozen everything else and we're just looking at this, this sequence here. So this is, I got F2 by just changing that rightmost uh, two to a three. And let's keep going. So this is the rest of, I keep applying F. And now if I apply F again, well, or there, there, I get to zero, there's nothing left to do. Okay, and let's go backwards. Uh, if I wanna apply E2, then I change that rightmost three to a two. Oh, uh, sorry, uh, leftmost three to a two, I guess in this case, there's no difference. Um, okay, so this, this sequence here of these five elements that I get by changing these, these uh, blue twos um, is called a, an I string or a two string in this case. Okay, so you wanna think, a good way to think about a crystal is sort of being made, in, made up of these, um, these, these SL2 strings. So here are like, this is a two, this is a one string, I guess in blue, the blues are one strings and the, the, the red, the connected components of just the red stuff are the uh, two strings. Uh, and maybe just quickly, let's see. So how does our parentheses matching rule work in this little example? Well, it says for instance, this two and this one are paired off. Okay, so we don't, we can't uh, adjust those, but this one can change into a two when I apply F1. Um, so now let's, I want to tell you a little bit about how crystals are related to the RSK correspondence. So um, we'll let B mu denote the tensor product of these single row crystals. Mm. The order I'm using is opposite. Uh, the reason is we're often going to want this to be a partition and somehow the combinatorics comes out better when this guy is the biggest one. Okay, so uh, let me just 
give you a quick uh, idea of what um, insertion and recording Tableau are if you haven't seen it before. So, um, so I, I want to think of these elements of, of this tensor product as bywords. So this, this word on the bottom here is the one we've been talking about before. And, and now this top word here is just telling me sort of about which tensor product of crystals it came from. So I take my rightmost, you know, B mu one, and that's how many ones I put here and then twos and so on. Okay. But this is sometimes a convenient way uh, of, of writing down a word from the crystal. So now I'm going to take, I'm going to start from the right to, to tell you to um, do this. This is this in this version of the RSK correspondence. What I do is I start from the right and I column insert the two, uh, the bottom letters. So I'm going to insert those um, two, two, you know, two, one, one to get this. Let's just maybe keep going this way and, and then I'll explain what's happening. So let's do this very last step. So this two is going to get column inserted uh, into the left here. So that's going to bump the two, bump the three, and so on, all the way down until it bumps the four. And then the four is going to go to the bottom, uh, to the top row here. Okay. And then the Q tableau, well, there's no insertion here. This just, uh, it always has the same shape as the P tableau. And at every step, we just put in the, the letters from the top word, okay, to make the shape the same as the P tableau. So this is related to crystals in the following way. Um, so if I, I take this tensor product uh, of crystals, uh, single row crystals in this case, and I wanna know uh, how it breaks into uh, a disjoint union of connected components. Remember, I told you that all of the connected components are just of this type B of lambda. So we wanna know uh, which B of lambdas those are in this uh, disjoint union. Okay, so the, the theorem is that uh, this is just kind of maybe one half of what you could say, but this is focusing on the recording Tableau side. So the connected components are given by uh, the set of words with a fixed recording Tableau is in this example. So um, all of these words, now you have to remember this byword thing. So basically everything here you wanna, since it comes from B21, it secretly has a, the top word is one, one, two, reading from right to left. And then when you do this insertion procedure, uh, the Q tableau of all of these words is this one, one, two here. On the left here, the Q tableau is always uh, this, this, sh this um, shape for this tableau. Okay, um, so that's one part of this, the Q tableau label components. Uh, on the other hand, the P tableau uh, label the vertices. So this is like this example I mentioned in the, in the very beginning. So these, this is all of the semi-standard Young tableau uh, of shape um, two one with letters one up to three that you get here. Okay. So these are sort of maybe the most common way to describe one of these type finite type A crystals. Um, but you know, for us, these words are sort of even equally good description, I would say. Uh, in fact, um, in this case, Actually, these are just the um, row reading words of the corresponding tableau, though that doesn't happen in general. Um, okay, so the sort of the P tableau sort of tells you are well, where you are within a given uh, component, and the Q tableau tells you gives you a label for each component. And and I guess maybe you can't see it in this example, but just to uh, make it a little clearer, if I had two components of this shape, which can't happen, actually, we'll see an example of that later then these corresponding P tableau would be the same, okay, right? This is all the semi-standard Young tableau of this shape. So they would be exactly the same, but the Q tableaus would be different. Okay, okay so now just kind of a, a broad picture here. Um, so the character of a crystal is just uh, the, the um, polynomial you get by taking um, x to the, the taking the sum over x to the weight. So, in this example, let's say this component has um, character equal to the Schur function s three, and so this is its character is given by right. This word becomes like x one cubed. This word becomes x one squared, x two, x x one, x two squared, and so on. Okay. So now, 
Now, sort of, there's three different, you know, things we can line up here. Sort of at the left is just on the level of characters. We can multiply the sure function S1 times S2 and get a sum of, uh, a sum of sure functions, okay? And then on the right is sort of maybe the most, this, this is kind of in increasing level of structure. So on the right is uh, something you can do on the level of representations. You can take the tensor product of two irredu irreducible representations and then decompose it into a direct sum of irreducibles. Okay, so these, all these three, three things line up, but this one is sort of maybe has the richest structure, but is also kind of the hardest to compute with. Uh, whereas this one is easier to compute with, but you know, sort of harder to know exactly what the right thing to do is. This is kind of a general picture about how crystals help to connect uh, representation theory and combinatorics. So crystals are lie nicely in the middle here, and they give kind of a combinatorial skeleton for what's happening in the representations. Um, and, and so, for instance, there is a way to make that precise actually where the crystals, the, these crystal elements correspond to bases of these representations. Um, and when I follow one of these edges, it's basically, so this is like, this is an F1 edge. There's an element of the corresponding um, Lie algebra that, that takes me from, from this basis element to this basis element. Uh, except not quite exactly. I mean, th there, it's only a pro an approximation, but but um, there is a way to make that precise. And and so in that sense, the uh, crystal gives a kind of combinatorial skeleton for what's actually happening in the representations. Okay, but it it's a nice way to extract out combinatorics. Uh, in particular, you can get this decomposition into irreducibles just by looking at connected components. Okay, so uh, the next thing I want to tell you about are uh, certain subsets of crystals called Demajure crystals. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll let u sub lambda denote the highest weight element of a crystal B lambda. So that's this element on the top right here. Uh, it's the one with only um, F edges and no E edges coming out of it. Okay. Uh, and then starting from this highest weight element, we're going to construct certain special subsets of the crystal. Uh, in the following way. So, so I started with just the highest weight element, and then I'm going to apply this capital F1 operator. And what that does is it says, just follow the, the blue arrows and just take everything you get by following the blue arrow from what you already have. And you also keep the stuff that you had previously. Okay, now follow a red arrow. Get anything you can get. You add in anything you get by following red arrow, keep what you had, and then so on. So now follow blue arrow. Okay, so this, anything you get like this is, is a Demajure crystal. Uh, and it turns out that there, there are sort of permutate, um, well, uh, there's naturally indexed by, um, by elements of the symmetric group. Okay, and so it's, what well, you have to know to sort of uh, um, make this connection is basically these capital F operators applied to the highest weight element satisfy the braid relation. Um, and then that means that it's sort of natural to index these Demajure crystals by just um, the permutation corresponding to those simple, that product of simple reflections. So this is the same as what you would get if you did F2, F1, F2. Okay. All right, so now on the level of characters, let's look at what happens. So um, what you get are, called, are now called key polynomials if you take the characters of these Demajure crystals. And um, the one way to, I mean, so that's one definition, I, I guess, of a key polynomial. Another definition is what you get by applying these uh, Demajure operators that we talked about before, uh, starting with a monomial, uh, a dominant monomial, actually. Okay, and so um, these, um, uh, just to say a word about the indexing here, the, uh, the weight you get here, um, is, is actually the weight of, there's a sort of a lowest weight element of each Demajure crystal. Uh, so this has weight one, zero, two, that's the indexing uh, element for the key polynomial. Okay, but, but basically this is just the character version of what we saw with the, with the Demajure crystals. Okay. okay, so now I wanna tell you how this is related to catabolism. So, um, 
we define uh, what we call uh, dark crystals. So you have to read uh, backwards for this. So these are uh, Kirilov, Reshetik, and Affine Demajure crystals. Okay, and so um, the Kirilov, Reshetik, and Affine, this has to do with the fact that sort of the proper setting for this um, is with certain um, affine versions of crystals. Uh, but what, what we're doing now carries almost all of the information anyway. So we're not, we haven't lost much by not going to the affine case. Uh, so what this is, is it's some subset of this BMU, this tensor product of single row crystals. And it's the subset we get by alternating between applying these F operators, these FI operators, uh, then applying this F tau. So what this F tau does is it just rotates the letters basically. So it adds one to every letter. So here, for example, ones go to twos, twos go to threes and threes go to ones. So you have to rotate them cyclically. You can see sort of there's the, an affine type A thing happening here. Uh, you always wanna sort the result just because, right? That's where our elements live here. Um, and now you do this iterated um, applying F operators and tensoring with one of these words, just one, one, one. Okay, and so let's, let's see in an example what happens. Okay, so let's start with just the single crystal B1. Okay, and now apply an F tau operator. That means add one to every element, uh, mod, mod three. Uh, and then we tack on a one on the right. Uh, apply this F1 operator. That's follow the blue edges as much as we can. Now follow red edges. Now apply F tau. That does something weird to the crystal structure, but we, we're just adding one to all the letters. Now we add a one to the right. Uh, now I'm just redrawing it. Uh, follow the blue edges and now follow the red edges. So all of these things, well, not quite, almost all of these things we got along the way are examples of dark crystals. These are sort of distinguished subsets of this B mu. Okay, and so, uh, so, re, so by combining uh, several different results um, in the crystal literature, we were able to prove that um, uh, any dark crystal is isomorphic to a disjoint union of Demajure crystals. Okay, so if you notice, these, some of these guys we got along the way were similar to the, the examples of the Demajure crystals we already saw, okay. the connected components. I mean. okay, so disjoint union of Demajure crystals. This, I don't know any of, of any sort of direct proof of this. It goes through some connections to um, affine type A crystals. All right, so now we can state the following result. So let's let phi be this um, operator, which basically rotates the xi. Um, and the, so the result is that the charge weighted character of this dark crystal is key positive, uh, and it's given by this operator expression. So I haven't told you what, let's not worry about this st statistic quite yet, but just to think about what this means. So basically we saw before that, um, these pi i operators are connected to the capital F i operators, right? So in the definition of the dark crystal, right, it's this combination of F tau's, F w's, and then tensoring with stuff. So all of those just basically directly turn into um, the, the expressions in this form. The F tau's turn into phi's, the tensoring with B, you know, this B sub uh, S turns into a multiplying by X one to some power um, okay, and, and something nice happens with the Q statistic too, but I don't think I have time to tell you about that, or maybe at the end or something in questions. Um, okay, so let's just go through this again and, and see the key positivity. So here are the characters of everything. So if you'll notice, um, the when we apply one of these capital F operators, the key polynomial expression changes in a predictable way. It just, you just end up permuting the entries of the key polynomial. But now when you do this um, F tau operator followed by a tensoring uh, with what, like adding ones at the end, then something weird can happen to the key expansion, like as in this example. So this, by the way, this intermediate step here. So when I just do F tau, 
I get something that's no longer a dark crystal. It's really maybe better to think of the F tau followed by the tensoring as a single operation. Okay, so we always preserve key positivity if we think of it that way. Okay. And so maybe just a couple words about uh, sort of very last step here. Um, so the way you go from dark crystals to this catabolizability combinatorics is through this map in. Okay, so I take a byword, right? Remember, I'm thinking of these being used as bywords, or I can at least. So, um, so now what, what you do to take invis, this is just sort of a natural generalization of the inverse of a permutation. So you take the bottom word and the top word, and then you exchange them. Uh, and then you sort, um, basically you think of each of these as, as a by letter, uh, and then you sort the results so that the top is weakly decreasing and each of these blocks is weakly increasing. Maybe a, another, a more direct way to say it might be, like, let's just do this example. So the, this four and this four here on the bottom, they turn in, so then I have to look at what the top corresponding top letters are, two and three, and then I sort those and I get this block here. And then now notice that um, that the this this um, byword here is sort of naturally um, the same thing as a tabloid. So basically, by bywords are essentially the same as tabloids. The correspondence is I just think of each of these blocks as a row in my tabloid. Okay. And so the the connection between these dark crystals um, and tabloids is the following. So there's a bijection. This in gives a bijection between uh, certain kinds of dark crystals and um, the set of tabloids uh, such that, so this here is the insertion tableau of the tabloid, which means I take the row, row reading word of the tabloid and I insert, insert it into a tableau. It has to have that catabolizability property I told you before. Okay. Um, this the explanation for why this comes in is basically um, we have uh, this W naught here. Uh, this this is the longest element. So when I have this guy at the end, that means that all my crystals, all remember we saw these are these are always disjoint unions of Demajure crystals, but because of the W naught, they're actually disjoint unions of actual GLL crystals. So that means that they sort of come in chunks corresponding to um, uh, you know GLL crystals, which are naturally labeled by their Q tableau. Okay. And now when you go in, you take in, then Q turns into P. So that's kind of, that's where this P tableau is coming from. Okay. And so, so we only need to know, we only sort of need to do this on the level of uh, the insertion tableau rather than looking at kind of each, a condition that's individual to each tabloid. All right. Uh, so, um, so this is, this is a theorem that connects uh, the dark crystals to catabolism. Um, and then, I think I'm going to just try to end here in the interest of time, but basically um, uh, we can see just to give some flavor of, of what's going on here. Um, I'm going to skip these slides, but the the idea is that if I take in cat and in, this is essentially f tau inverse. So if I um, one way to think about this is is basically what is um. What does cat do? So cat essentially is rotating the rows, rows of a tabloid. Um, whereas this F tau inverse or F tau is sort of adding one to all letters, right? So under the inv map, adding one to all letters, of course, like this is like rotating letters. And then on this side, it's rotating rows. That's what kind of the inv correspondence does for you. Okay, so just to get a flavor of what that is. Okay, so when we sort of put it all together and we take characters of both sides of this uh, bijection, we get a connection between dark crystals and catabolism, um, which, which ends up, well, there's, there's a few other steps we have to do. Um, one that I didn't really get a chance to tell you about, but um, it's, this is kind of a just character level calculation that, um, that there, it's hard to say anything about in the talk. Anyway, we combine it with this result uh, and some of the other results I told you about, like the one giving uh, the character formula for our dark crystal, and that recovers this theorem I told you about. So that's kind of a brief sketch of how crystals are are connected to uh, the catabolizability picture. All right, sorry for going so long. Um,
thank you guys for your time.